thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for joining session four, which is about changing workplaces in Australia and New Zealand, what you need to know to prepare your business. My name is Clancy King. I'm a special counsel in the employment practice here in Sydney. Uh, before I introduce Laura, I'll just do a quick acknowledgement that we're meeting today on the lands of the Gadigal people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to my own elders of the UN nation in the south coast of New South Wales. Uh, I'm joined by Laura Scampion, who is a partner and managing partner of DLA Piper New Zealand, and we'll cover the Kiwi aspects of what we're here to talk about today. Thank you, Clancy. Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm looking forward to um, hearing about some changes in Australia and sharing some that are happening in New Zealand at the moment. All right, so as you can see, uh, it's a bumper edition for both Australia and New Zealand. We are absolutely going to race through just enough to make you aware of what's going on. We will try very hard to leave some time for questions at the end. We'll probably run out, but we'll try very hard to leave some time or otherwise we'll both be around afterwards. So let's dive straight in to Australia's Respect at Work Act, which I'm sure you're all aware by now uh, has come in at the end of last year and was a key election platform of the Labor government uh, to make these pretty fundamental changes to what's happening in Australian workplaces. The two key changes are a new positive prohibition on conduct which creates a hostile workplace environment on the basis of sex. And the second is the introduction of a new positive duty to effectively eliminate uh, sex discrimination. From what we can tell, it's world leading. Uh, we know that the UK briefly considered introducing something like this in 2021, but did not proceed yet. Uh, but we also know they're watching to see how this plays out down in Australia. So if we start with this prohibition or the new obligation to ensure that there is no workplace environment which is hostile on the grounds of sex, what it means is a reasonable person having regard to all the circumstances, as you can tell, pretty standard language, uh, would have anticipated the possibility of the conduct resulting in a workplace environment being offensive, intimidating or humiliating to the other person by reason of, as you can see, their sex, but also a characteristic that appertains generally to persons of that sex or a characteristic generally imputed to persons of the sex of the person. What all of that means is actually what it kind of boils down to a fairly standard prohibition that a workplace environment shouldn't make people of a particular sex deeply uncomfortable. And the kinds of factors that are going to be looked at, the seriousness, whether the conduct was a one-off or a pattern of behaviour, the role, influence or authority of the person engaging in that conduct, and then the classic any other relevant circumstances. But what that's likely to mean really is was the workplace otherwise aware of this behaviour and didn't put a stop to it? That's what we're expecting. It's going to be really focused on. In terms of the positive duty, so the duty holder, effectively the employer, uh, has to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate, so far as possible, these things, sex discrimination, sexual harassment, importantly, also victimisation in relation to complaints of issues of that kind. The reason that this is so much more onerous than it is at present is because at the moment, a lot of people understand these obligations to ensure that there's no sex discrimination or, or sexual harassment in the workplace to be limited to the classic of, you know, a code of conduct, a workplace policy dealing with it. You run your standard training once a year and, and that's kind of enough. And so long as you deal with complaints when they arise, you've ticked your box. That's not going to work anymore. And it's actually about making sure that the business is taking positive, proactive steps to address this risk in the same way that you address other risks in the business. It's a work health and safety style approach. What uh, processes are you putting in place to identify and eliminate these issues? Of course, what that all means, still fairly up in the air. The Human Rights Commission, though, is publishing some guidelines. They've just said the middle of this year, so we'll see when they come through, about the kinds of things that they're expecting employers will do to satisfy this duty. And so, obviously, the second they come out, 
we will be able to tell you more and we'll be writing more about that. But that will kind of set the, the benchmark of what you're being expected to do. So the positive duty and the uh, hostile working environment prohibition uh, are both in effect, but critically, the other key provisions that have come into place, for example, the additional compliance powers for the Human Rights Commission to enforce these things, not yet in place and won't be in place until the end of this year, which is why you've got a bit of time to see those guidelines and work out how you're going to address it in your business. Um, the Human Rights Commission will also have the power to enter workplaces and issue compliance notices for, to enforce these kinds of new prohibitions. And then importantly, I think the other key one that comes out of here is a lower bar for what actually constitutes sexual harassment. Uh, all they've done is strike out the seriously in the definition so that it's now just conduct, unwelcome conduct, which deme of a demeaning nature, de demeaning nature in relation to the person harassed. And that's enough very quickly on Respect at Work for a hand to Laura. Thanks, Clancy. So in, in New Zealand, our employment law is really governed by two different types of employment agreement. One is an individual employment agreement and the other one is a collective, essentially an enterprise agreement. And um, we don't have modern awards, but now we have something called the fair pay agreements, which has been sort of hailed in New Zealand as the most significant change in New Zealand employment law in 20 years. It's come under a huge amount of criticism, uh, has had a lot of bad press, as it were, a little bit of positive press too when the new unions get involved. But essentially, it's a type of system that is modelled broadly on modern awards. So now, after the Fair Pay, Agreement, where, uh, Fair Pay Agreement Act was introduced in December, we'll in fact, across many industries, have three different types of agreement. Um, and in some industries, all three will apply. Um, you'll have a fair pay agreement. You could have a collective agreement that a union has negotiated separately in a particular workplace. And you may also have individual employment agreements. So fair pay agreements, what are they? If we move to the first slide, um, Clancy, it's a type of collective agreement that sets a standard, a floor as it were. So it says all these people in this industry or this particular occupation um, cannot be paid less than this, uh, must receive this amount of annual leave and so on. So very similar in that respect uh, to a modern award. Um, as I say, they sit alongside a collective agreement that's already been negotiated or an individual employment agreement. They just set the minimum terms or the floor. Most of them will be for a term of between three to five years, so quite long term for those types of agreements. And the, the intention behind them really is to allow um, those employees in lower paid industries and occupations better bargaining positions and in fact to, to bring the floor up in terms of minimum wage. So if we have a look at who it affects, Clancy, on the next slide, so the government are funding the bargaining of these um, fair pay uh, agreements. Bear in mind in New Zealand that it is election year. So this was pushed uh, This was pushed through relatively quickly by our Labour government, whilst Jacinda Ardern was still in charge. We now have a new Prime Minister who's not putting too many hands on employment laws and changing those before election, but it's all go in terms of the fair pay uh, agreements. So... It was always anticipated when the Fair Pay Agreement Act came in that in the first year of the legislation, four of these agreements would be negotiated. Now, bearing in mind that they'll apply right across an industry, for example, you know, retail checkout or, or bus drivers, um, it was fairly ambitious. But we already have on the Fair Pay Agreement dashboard that the regulator operates four applications for fair pay bargaining. So it's really all underway. We're only in February. It is likely before election that we might have a couple of fair pay agreements in place. Watch this space, though, because if a Conservative government is elected in New Zealand uh, and on October the 14th, then this may be wiped out. And in fact, there has been uh, a little bit of narrative from the national government that in fact they're not in favour of fair pay agreements, that they run contrary to a fair market and it's not something they support. So... Four applications are currently with the regulator for bargaining for a fair pay agreement. These are being assessed. They are for hospitality workers, supermarket workers, 
uh, bus drivers. A BUSS is not a particular special mode of transport in New Zealand. It's a it's a typo. Um, and the cleaners, that, that is not going ahead now. So, so we've got hospitality, um, bus drivers, two different sections of bus drivers uh, and supermarket workers. Interestingly, about the same time that these applications for bargaining for a fair pay agreement were lodged, both supermarket chains in New Zealand up their ante in terms of minimum wage and improved terms and conditions. So it remains to be seen whether even bargaining for a fair pay agreement in the supermarkets is going to make any uh, difference to those minimum standards anyway. Bearing in mind that in New Zealand we have a duopoly, there's only two supermarket chains, so they control, uh, they have all the power as it were. So look, the industries that are going to be most likely impacted are those with minimum code. We're not expecting, obviously, to see any movement from the union and industries where people are paid well over the minimum wage because it's a bit of a waste of time um, getting those, those sectors or industries together. It really is a piece of legislation to, to protect those in that, in that sort of lower bracket of earnings. Um, and, and fair pay agreements can vary drastically um, depending on whether or not the union makes an application, for example, for a type of employee or an occupation to be covered or, in fact, an entire industry. So what we're seeing with the hospitality uh, application is a very, very wide application, whereas the bus drivers has quite narrow coverage in parts. So if we've moved through, and I'm going to whip through this quite quickly, because in typical New Zealand fashion, it is ridiculously complicated to uh, bargain for a fair pay agreement. And like I said, I think we might have two done by the election, but um, perhaps I'm being too optimistic. But basically, a union has to either have 10% of the particular workforce that they want covered or a thousand employees um, sign up to bargain for a fair pay agreement. You can imagine in hospitality, that's relatively easy to get, you know, a couple of days traveling through the South Island, you're gonna get those numbers. There's also a public interest test. So you can actually make an application for a fair pay agreement as, uh, if, uh, if you are a union, if you can identify a particular occupation or industry where people are low paid, there's no progression, Generally, they don't um, don't move up the, the sort of wage scale, as it were. Um, the fair pay agreement must be approved by the regulator, which is where those applications are now. And then there's got to be notification. So the union have to notify uh, all the affected employers of what they've done. And the employers have 15 days to notify unions and employees that it's all go, we're going to bargain. The employees are represented by a union, so it's very similar to a collective agreement uh, in New Zealand. But again, as I say, it provides the floor and it can apply across industries. Uh, and um, the employers must form an association. Now, this has been a huge kerfuffle in New Zealand about this legislation because originally when the legislation was floated, the government said, well, Business New Zealand will be the employer representative. Business New Zealand said, no thanks, we don't want any part of this. It's not something we support and we're not going to represent employers in bargaining. Now, we thought that would be the end of the legislation because it would be so difficult to bring different employer uh, associations to the table to bargain on, on part of what could sometimes be 100 or 200 employers. But no, the legislation has been moved through and we're a little bit in the dark about who's going to represent these employers at the bargaining table. We've got a couple of associations that have put their hands up. For example, Retail New Zealand have said, well, if an application goes in to cover retail, then we'll represent. But it's not crystal clear in New Zealand who's actually going to do this bargaining uh, on the employer's side. So, you know, slight, um, slight spanner in the works there, but we'll see how it unfolds. Now, if the parties don't form properly, and I would imagine that this is more on the employer side, then the terms of the fair pay agreement that can apply right across an industry can actually be set by the Employment Relations Authority, which is very similar to your Fair Work Commission. Now, in terms of determining coverage, like I've said, it can be across an industry or a particular occupation. If 25% more or more of an employee's role is covered, then they will come within that fair pay agreement. So just moving on, Clancy, to a little bit more about the bargaining. Um, as you can see there, these are the terms that it must include, obviously, base wages, overtime, that kind of thing. The legislation also points out things that must be discussed but not agreed on, health and safety, arrangements in relation to redundancy, 
the normal things that you would see a union uh, raise. Um, Finalising, it has to go through a compliance assessment with the regulator, um, then it's ratified and verified um, according to votes. We move on to the next slide, um, Clancy. Now, this has been a bit controversial as well because our Employment Relations Authority, which is sort of the lowest forum that you go in to resolve an employment dispute, is going to have a huge role here um, in terms of setting um, terms if they can't be agreed or assessing. Now, we've got a real issue with that because, it, not, not to criticise, but the quality of the Employment Relations Authority isn't always 100% in terms of the qualifications, the backgrounds that people come from and so on. There's going to have to be a huge amount of training for these individuals to set those terms, but more importantly, they're massively under-resourced. They're still going through COVID claims and how they're going to sort of sit down and, and verify or assess or set the terms of a fair pay agreement that might, might apply right across an industry is still, it's, it's quite difficult to comprehend how that's going to happen. So again, watch this space throughout the course of this year, we will see how all, all of that unfolds. Now, obviously there's quite significant penalties for employers breaching good faith, which are our, our favorite two words in New Zealand from an employment perspective, not coming to the table, not bargaining properly and so on. So there is a deterrent to not engaging in the process. And the last thing I'll say about uh, fair pay agreements is pretty much what I've covered already, the things that I think the employer bargaining sides are an issue. I'm not sure how that's going to work in practice. Um, it, it's impractical often if an employer receives a notice to tell every employee across that industry or every other employer what's going on. We don't even know the numbers of people uh, in particular industries or occupations. And one of the key issues with that is post-COVID, we've still got sort of slightly closed borders. We've got very, very high um, uh, employment rates. It's, it, it, it hasn't been followed very closely, as it were, since the borders opened. Um, there's a most favourable terms rule in the fair pay agreements, which means if you've got a collective agreement um, in your work, workplace, you can actually cherry pick which terms you want. Well, actually, I'll have the good holidays from the collective agreement, but I'll have the wages that set the floor in the fair pay agreement. I, it, it, I'm not, again, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but picking most favourable terms seems a little outrageous um, just from a practical perspective and managing that on the employer side. Like I've already mentioned, the Employment Relations Authority resourcing uh, is going to be an issue. And we have had a lot of discussions with our employer clients about collaboration. Now, if you have to come to the table with a whole lot of other employers working in your industry, there are potentially competition issues there. You may have to disclose confidential information, information about profit, information about market share and so on when you're negotiating. So it's not an ideal space to be sharing uh, with your competitors. So, I mean, I haven't exactly sold it to you, um, <laughs> but again, watch this space. It came in in December. Um, there is some movement already. And I think by election time, we'll probably have two fair pay agreements in New Zealand. All right, so the next one is a much more straightforward one for Australia before I dive back into our more complicated ones, which is just a reminder of the two key decisions that came down from the High Court at the end of last year that fundamentally reshaped how Australia approaches contractors, uh, independent contractors versus employees. So the two decisions um, referred to as personnel contracting is the first one and the second one is JAMSEC. They were heard together because they were exactly the same issue whether or not particular individuals were genuine employees, uh, or sorry, genuine contractors or were in fact employees. Um, previously, as I know I've spoken to some of you in this room about, you had to do a very fact specific assessment, employee person by person to check whether or not they were an employee or a contractor, bless you, because their contract was not the end of the story. The High Court has said, absolutely not, we don't like that. The contract prevails. So long as the parties have a comprehensive contract in place describing the relationship as one of independent contractor, and so long as there is no other basis to set aside the contract on, as a sham, for example, or entered into under duress, uh, that's what will prevail. It's an independent contractor relationship. For now, the Labor government has backed down from its initial comments that it would legislate to amend this and return it to the multifactorial uh, test, 
But the prediction is if they get a second term, they'll have another go at that and think about whether that's a legislative change that they'll bring in place to go back to what the common law used to do, which is the kind of assessment of a case-by-case nature of the relationship. Um, But as I say, so far, they haven't pursued that. So the two takeaways are really make sure you've got a good contract in place but also keep in mind that the sham contracting provisions under the Fair Work Act still have a role to play. So if you're deliberately seeking to avoid an employment relationship, the sham contracting provisions and therefore the penalties, the financial penalties penalties that can flow from that can still apply, but no one has tried to press that yet. I think the unions have back down from this particular challenge. They're focused on multi-employer bargaining, which we'll get to. Uh, But if, as I say, Labor gets a second term, they're likely to have another go at reversing this back to the common law provision. Quick one for me. Thanks, Clancy. Well, if you revert back, then you'll be the same as New Zealand, right? We'll just come back full um, circle. I will touch on that. (laughs) Um, Oh, in fact, I wonder if New Zealand will just follow follow suit. We usually do. And and look, Related to that, we in New Zealand, we use restraints of trade in employment agreements. Um, and we use probably the same that you would use in Australia, non-competes, non-poach, non-solicit, non-deal or your standard um, uh, restraints. But they can vary in term in New Zealand. We don't use waterfall um, periods. We would use, say, three months, six months, nine or 12 for very, very senior associates with a whole whole heap of control uh, and influence over clients. But this bill came out of nowhere. So we've got a bill, it's it's only on its first reading, Um, but what this would do is is it aims to reduce or remove the use of restraints in New Zealand. So you can imagine the business community is a little bit outraged uh, by this move. So the first thing that this bill says, and it's a very short piece of legislation, it's tiny, it basically says you can't do it. It says an employer must have a genuine proprietary interest to justify a restraint. That doesn't change the law at all. You've still got to have a genuine proprietary interest to restrain someone from competing or dealing or soliciting uh, in New Zealand. But what it then goes on to say is all restraints are banned for anyone that earns three times over the minimum wage. Now, that's about $120,000 New Zealand dollars. That's, that's three times the minimum wage. That's a rough calculation, 40-hour week and so on. Now, it's a random figure because in some industries, that could be someone quite senior. You know, there's a huge amount of fluctuation in New Zealand in terms of wages in the industry or sector in which you work. In some industries, that could be a junior person coming in. But what it endeavours to do is basically says you cannot use a restraint at all if you are under that figure. If you are over that figure, that 120,000, so you're generally looking at more senior employees, you can use a restraint, but only for six months. So absolutely no flexibility, a maximum of six months, doesn't mention notice periods, doesn't mention garden leave, I'm assuming that the silence in relation to garden leave means you can still pop someone on garden leave and then from the termination date use the six months, but it's not entirely clear. Um, Then the legislation goes on to say, if you use one for your person that's earning over 120,000 and you've got your six months uh, provision in there, you've got to pay them for that six months and you've got to pay them at half their salary that they were earning during their term of employment. Now, how this is going to work is not particularly clear. Is it a lump sum? So you get to your termination date, you know that you're restrained from soliciting clients for six months, you get your lump sum half money. It's not exactly a deterrent from going off and and competing or soliciting because getting money back off an employee as an employer in New Zealand is almost impossible and would cost just about as much to go through the court process to retrieve it. Is it a payment that goes through payroll? Kind of weird given they've reached their termination date. Do you need to keep them on some kind of special restraint payroll and drip feed them the half the salary every week, two weeks or month? Not Again, it's not, not entirely clear. Um, someone's mentioned, well, perhaps fixed term would be a way to deal with it. 
you, they come to their termination date, you put them on a special restraint of trade fixed term and you drip feed them the six months that way. So I'm not sure it's been uh, entirely thought through that well. Um, I'm not sure it's going to suit a whole heap of businesses, particularly with that sort of 120,000 limit. Um, it doesn't affect normal duties of confidentiality and fidelity, which are common law rights and obligations uh, in New Zealand. But given it's at its first reading, it, it, you know, the jury's out in terms of whether this is going to make it through. Like I said, our new Prime Minister looks a little bit hands-off with, with getting involved in employment law provisions and new legislation prior to our uh, election. So it may be that this remains uh, undecided until such time as the election uh, has been and gone. But this is something that again took us by surprise. It's in the background though, so bear it in mind that it could come through. But at the moment it needs a lot more work, I think, to be a practical um, a tool for employers. I've fallen apart on my slide duties. I apologise, Laura. Right. Increased employee entitlements for Australia. So just a couple of little piecemeal things, but again, reflecting that we have, um, we're both talking about governments and elections a lot, but we have a new government who was very keen to come in and make their mark uh, in a few different ways. So we've got increased paid family and domestic violence leave. As you can see, up to 10 days now in any 12-month period. So unlike other entitlements, it doesn't accrue over time. It's just you get 10 months, sorry, 10 days in your 12 months, and then you get a fresh 10 at the next 12-month period. Uh, there's a proposed increase. I mean, this is going to go through Parliament. It'd be a brave opposition who voted against increased paid parental leave at this point. So it will go through from uh, up to 20 weeks, but it's still the uh, employer, so the government funded uh, national minimum wage payments. There is a slight increase as well to the uh, effectively the family wealth before that they're tapped out of being able to make that payment. But then the last one that's kind of snuck its way in um, without legislative change is some proposed changes to the Professional Employees Award. So this is the modern award that it captures um, IT staff, software engineers, other kinds of engineers. Um, its name, Professional Employees, doesn't indicate it applies to all professionals, that it's those that subset. But the reason it's important to call it out is because this is the Fair Work Commission acting on its own initiative to amend the award because it accepted submissions from the, uni the relevant union Appeasma, that the uh, award just wasn't fit for purpose. And they're little used provisions that kind of hide out in the back end of the Fair Work Act that not a lot of people look at, but that give the Commission the power outside of the normal four-year review of annual of modern award uh, processes to just amend the award. And so this came up in the context of them discussing something else entirely in this modern award. And instead, through the judgment, they proposed a couple of key changes to the modern award. The first that would increase its coverage. So it would capture more people in that IT and engineering space. But secondly, at the moment, this is all employers' favourite awards because it's the most flexible. It's the one that says you can just compensate however you like for time worked overtime, time work spent on callback because a lot of IT professionals, for example, are waiting for the call that says, I can't get in, I've locked myself out again. Uh, those kinds of things at the moment, the employer can just compensate however they want. The, the proposed changes introduce uh, much more prescription, much more like every other modern award. So overtime is at a particular loading rate, uh, set hours of work so that hours outside of that are overtime. Um, they're currently still proposed because the commission realised what they were doing and so put it out in this judgment as a proposal, leaving it until March for the various industry bodies to respond. Um, and then they'll finalise likely some version of what I've just run through, probably not that different. So we want to put it on your radar, not only in case it happens to touch your business, but because the you may remember or you may not watch um, employment and industrial relations politics as closely as Laura and I, but there was a lot of talk about the outgoing coalition government having stacked 
the Fair Work Commission and made it to employer friendly. So Labor's decision now is how are we going to, as they would to say, uh, rebalance the bench. There's been a new appointment for a president announced in the last couple of weeks and they're out there looking for new commission members. And they're looking, this is me just passing on a lot of industry gossip at this point, but it is important. Uh, they're looking for much more highly legally qualified individuals to fill those commission roles because there has been criticism, not dissimilar to what Laura was talking about, about the variable quality that you get on the bench. And so you're going to see a lot of appointments from people with union and le union legal backgrounds. And we expect a lot more of the commission kind of exploring its own power in this way, having a think about the things that they can be doing um, that are outside the scope of their normal processes. That's another quick one for me. My mic's still on? Yes, it is. Right, so... I'm also going to touch on uh, independent and independent contractors. So we just had the Uber case in New Zealand where it was held that Uber drivers are employees. Uh, so big decision, everybody waited with bated breath uh, to find out what had happened. But I think we had a decision in the UK that held that Uber drivers were employees. But in fact, the Australian decision is different, isn't it? Um, yes, because yeah. we did it. <laughs> Well, you, you must be better than us. Um, we, we didn't argue the Uber, Uber case. But look, so so that is, if that gives you an indication of where New Zealand employment law is heading, that is a very good one. So very, very similar factual scenarios uh, in New Zealand. I mean, Uber drivers are not that different uh, per jurisdiction, but in New Zealand, they are employees. And they have just... Um, got a union together and they are bargaining for a collective agreement. So completely different sort of landscape to be an Uber driver uh, in New Zealand. Um, now that leads me on to first slide um, here, Clancy, in terms of where, where the government are going with the status misclassification or dependent independent contractor. We do have the same issues in New Zealand as you have in Australia. People sort of hiding real employment relationships under that sort of contractor heading. We have what we call the dark side of franchising too. So that's uh, franchises that are competing, for example, and, and I'll use this example broadly for cleaning contracts. And they know if they, un they can undercut their competitor by paying lower rates to contractors rather than minimum wage. So you might have quite a, um, a tidy employer going in, knowing that they can only do a particular margin because they are paying minimum wage, losing out on contract contracts because the competing cleaning company are in fact paying below the minimum wage and dressing everybody up as a contractor, saying, well, actually, they're cleaning for a whole lot of other people. You know, there's no employment relationship. So we do have these issues in New Zealand. The government have looked at it and said, well, actually, why don't we create a third um, class of worker? So we currently in New Zealand only have contractor and employee. You've got to decide what you are or the employer decides what you are generally through documentation. They've now decided actually we'll have a dependent contractor, probably similar to the worker definition uh, in the UK. Now, the government has said this change is imminent, but like I said, new Prime Minister, a little bit hands off with change. So whether it comes in or not before October, we're not clear. There's nothing in draft yet, so I think it's going to be a little while away. And actually, with decisions coming out of the court like Uber, does the government need to intervene? The courts are actually deciding whether or not someone's a contractor or, a, or an employee and are being um, fairly open about, about leaning on the employee's side. So this has been on the agenda for our government since about 2017, 2018. We compare notes a bit, don't we, Clancy, in terms of what the courts decide and where the government's going with this, because it's really important for our clients, many of whom still like to have that contractor population in their workforce, and for good reason, because many individuals only want to be a contractor now. They don't want to be an employee. So there's, there's of course, some pressure from the other side. So there's talk about creating this third category um, of worker, um, the government has said a contractor is only one who can make a business decision uh, than themselves and operate on their own account. That's kind of common sense to us, and it's one of the tests we use. Um, 
We use in New Zealand still the multifactorial test, which Clancy referred to earlier, looking at how an individual is integrated into a business, how much they're controlled by that employer, whether the work they do or the nature of their role is fundamental to that business. So very classic tests, as it were, and that's what was used in the Uber case to decide, in fact, that those drivers were employers, employees. So factors like having more than one principal if you're a contractor will we'll get a court to lean towards the fact that you are a contractor. However, if you're driving around or doing something in uniform, um, it, being paid a bonus, that's going to indicate that, in fact, you are integrated into the organisation uh, and that you should, uh, in fact, be an employee. Um, setting one's own hours, again, leans towards the fact that you're probably a contractor and you've got a little bit more of that freedom. So this is going to have impl implications for our uh, clients who do rely on having a workforce that's a mix of employees and contractors. As I say, we're not sure when this is going to arrive. But also, this could have an impl uh, and implications for many of those workers who come into New Zealand who want to have a choice. So they do want to be contractors for a number of different reasons, whether they're travelling through or they're short term. Uh, there's often tax reasons why they want to be uh, contractors and so on. So... Um, Watch the space, it could change. I'm not sure it's going to go in the direction of Australia in terms of let's just look at the documents. Uh, in fact, it's written into our legislation that the documents really only are one aspect that the court will consider when looking at its status or, or misclassification when deciding whether or not that person is actually an employee or a contractor. All right, so next for Australia is the big omnibus uh, Secure Jobs Better Pay Act, which we also now have, which was another kind of delivery by the government on a bunch of election promises. And it covers a whole lot of different topics. So we'll kind of just pick out a few of them now. Uh, the first is a limitation on the use of fixed term contracts. So, in, and effectively what it's designed to do is stop people being on rolling fixed term contracts indefinitely. There are some exceptions. If, for example, the reason you have the person on a fixed term contract is because you're reliant on government funding for their, for funding their role. So there's an ability there for have to have a bit of a carve out. Uh, there are not many others. Um, so covering for parental leave is one, again, it, pretty limited. Uh, so the starting point is that it's pro prohibited to have rolling contracts, including renewals, for more than two years. And there's also a new obligation to give someone a fixed term contract information statement to that person. So similar to the fair work information statement you're already required to give or the casual employee information statement that you give to your casuals. Um, it, for us, it helps to think about the overall purpose of all of this is in the name, uh, but it's about giving all of these changes are giving employees additional rights. Uh, and then the, the flow on from that is, of course, it does impose additional restrictions on how you actually structure your business. Uh, so the first, as I say, limitation on fixed term contracts for more than two years. The next one uh, didn't get quite as much press, but will probably um, start to really take an impact over the next, say, six months. So flexible working arrangements have always been in place. Uh, and they're the specific statutory right to request that your working arrangements be flexible for one of a particular list of certain reasons. So you've got a disability, you're caring for children or parents, uh, you're experiencing domestic violence, for example. So they're only triggered in those specific circumstances. Historically, have you received one of those? All you had to do was make sure you responded in writing in 21 days. The substance of your response was not really anything that the employee could then challenge. You just had to have reasonable business grounds. Now, if the request is refused, the employee can make an application in the Fair Work Commission. Uh, and then the Fair Work Commission has the power to arbitrate that uh, dispute. So it's another way for an employee to seek the intervention of the Commission. That's why we're thinking it probably will start to take effect as people realise that this is out there and how this is going to work. Um, it's not clear yet. We don't have any decisions yet of the Fair Work Commission actually arbitrating that dispute. Um, but what it means is they'll be able to make very specific orders similar to stop bullying orders they can make at the moment that are 
incredibly intrusive in terms of what you must do to facilitate that flexible work request. So they could order, for example, that you are required to allow that person to split their day, for example, to leave and go and collect their kids and then log back on. Now, of course, a lot of employers are very happy to do that. That's not an issue so long as the work's being done and we've all got lives and people have to go pick up their kids, no problem. But where it often becomes a problem is that it inadvertently, if the employee is a modern award covered, triggers an extra, extra payment right they have because of the hours they're logging back on. And that's not necessarily why they're making the request, but it's an obligation you have then to comply. And so that economic cost will be something that the Fair Work Commission will be looking at. And we expect you'll have to put on quite detailed evidence as to why that cost can't be absorbed because the starting point would be, it's not that big a difference. You should be able to absorb that cost. The next one that has got much a bit more attention is the pay secrecy term. So effectively prohibiting, requiring your people not to talk about their pay with each other. Importantly, it's not just that employees that you can't prohibit disclosure of remuneration in a contract, but importantly, you, you can't prohibit employees discussing terms and conditions of their employment reasonably necessary to understand remuneration. So it's a lot more than just the salary. And it's actually as far as all of your incentive documentation, all of your bonus schemes, your commission schemes, but arguably goes even further because if you think about all the different things that make up how someone is paid, it actually captures a lot of information. Um, for example, you might have employees who participate in a global equity scheme and you're now going to have to be able to uh, allow people to discuss those terms and conditions as well. Um, it has a little bit of a ring of what Laura's talked about in a few ways of not really being thought through. It was definitely introduced as a kind of way of, again, if you think about what this government's trying to achieve, employees being able to discuss this information so they can bargain uh, and discuss their salaries then back with their employers and say, well, I know what Clancy's paid, so why am I not getting the same? Um, but it does go a lot broader than just I know Clancy's salary, it's actually all the other things that go up into each person's overall remuneration. Um, and I'm specifically using remuneration because that's the term used in the Fair Work Act, uh, but it's not defined. And so that's why I say there's a lot, part of why we say there's a lot of scope there for that to be much, much broader and contested. Every employee, yep. Every, yeah. Whether or not, you know, the CEO is quite comfortable telling everyone their salary is a different <laughs> different issue. It's not a positive duty to run around and tell everyone. It's just the <laughs> positive duty to stop people being able to run around and tell everyone. So the next one that has got a lot of attention is the multi-employer bargaining that has come through in a couple of different ways. Uh, two critical things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, there are anti-avoidance provisions in there. So a lot of clients are coming to us and it's very open. Um, and I know that there are lots of clients in lots of sectors are thinking about it in lots of different ways. Um, should we just run out and get an enterprise agreement right now so that we can't get roped in to a multi-employer enterprise agreement down the track? That does not work because there are provisions in there that allow the Fair Work Commission to effectively overturn the one that you've rammed through as a way of avoiding getting caught into these uh, multi-employer bargaining streams. The second key thing to think about, um, and we don't have any case law on this yet, obviously, because it's only just come through, is the way that employers are going to be able to be roped in to these bigger agreements. Um, there were some changes that were kind of pushed through to the bill right at the last minute to get the kind of crossbenchers on side to get this passed. That introduced a new test um, that hadn't really had a lot of legal thinking behind it in terms of what the common interests would be that would allow the Fair Work Commission to rope someone in. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty as to how that will play out. And as you can imagine, a lot of unions doing a lot of their own strategizing in the background about which sectors they're going to target first and exactly how they're going to go about it. Because for them, this is as much about an opportunity to increase ever declining membership rates as anything else by being able to kind of sell that as a reason to sign up and then get involved in this process. 
back to Laura. I think that will work. So have you had multi-employer collective bargaining here before? Yes. Yeah. We have, uh, but not in the same way. Yeah. And historically it was, we're basically kind of back to the future yeah. here. Um, like New Zealand. <laughs> correct. <laughs> so we have lots of multi-employer collective bargaining in New Zealand. We call it a MECA, multi-employer collective agreement. And it's generally across before healthcare was centralised, district health boards and so on, um, where you might get 20 employers, anywhere between five and 20 employers, part of an agreement. So um, they can be quite hard to reach agreement on. And just like New Zealand, the Fair Work Commission has returned to historical powers it used to have uh, and now has again to be able to intervene and arbitrate in those disputes much earlier and much more actively than they are currently able to intervene. Okay, so this one's sort of non-controversial in New Zealand. I think this is the first one I've mentioned that I don't have a gripe with. So in New Zealand, you have 90 days from an incident or an event to bring a personal grievance. And that's quite key because you can't go to the Employment Relations Authority until you've raised a personal grievance with your employer. So the general kind of chain of events goes like this. You have an issue at work, you either write a letter to your employer about it or you instruct a lawyer to do so and you do that within the 90 days, then the employer responds. If you can't reach agreement, then you head off to mediation or to the Employment Relations Authority. So I suppose a personal grievance is the, um, the pin on which you know all employment complaints turns. So you've got 90 days to raise this grievance. The pressure does come on sometimes, particularly if these negotiations between an employer and employee, and the employee hasn't quite labelled it a personal grievance yet, and you get up to sort of 75, 80 days, they've actually got to put a personal grievance in, which puts the employer to huge cost in terms of investigating, researching, writing a response, getting it dealt with. So this personal grievance bill is something that I think will go through um, relatively quickly. It's currently in its third reading. Um, and it extends time to raise a personal grievance for sexual harassment to 12 months. Now, this discussions about this bill began a long time ago off the back of the Me Too movement, really, in terms of there are so many people in workplaces that suffer harassment that just don't raise the issue and then think once they've left, actually, that was what was happening and I do need to raise it in order to protect others. Alternatively, this can be used for consecutive issues that are happening in a workplace so that you don't run out of time because something hasn't happened recently. So the upside is I think this will lead to workplaces, to use your term, Clancy, that are less hostile, have less harassment in them. You have a longer period of time as an employee to raise a grievance. It will lead to uncertainty for employers because we do have a little bit of a, um, a vibe in New Zealand, as it were, that once you pass the 90 days, if you did have a tricky employee, you're in the clear because they can't raise a grievance, they can't take you to the authority, off you go. So this is going to, you're going to have to wait longer to work out whether or not an employee is going to come after you, have a go or raise a complaint. Um, now, this, as I've said in the slide, unanimous recommendation that it be passed and unanimous approval in the New Zealand government. We're good like that when it comes to social policy like sexual harassment. So I think you can see that you can expect that that will probably go through. All right, we'll just race through the last couple then. So we've got some time for questions. Some changes to long service leave in New South Wales, um, again, through some case law rather than statutory change. So at the moment, uh, long service leave is still dealt with on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, it was the, pretty much the only entitlement, uh, employee entitlement left behind by the states when the Fair Work Act came in in 2009, the reason being because it's messy and it was just too hard. They could not get uniformity across the states and territories. So we've still got a state-by-state -state system. Importantly, and I hate admitting this, New South Wales is now caught up to Victoria, uh, but the case says that unlike historically where so long as you ended your employment in New South Wales, even if you'd spent the first 20 years in the UK, the whole 20 years counted. Uh, that is no longer the case. It is a much more sensible decision. So now for both New South Wales and Victoria, prior service outside the state, whether it's uh, interstate or 
in another country will only count towards your entire period of service for determining that entitlement if there was a genuine substantial connection to the state. So, for example, um, the decision in New South Wales was some uh, technology workers who had spent most of their careers in India came down to Australia for a short period and under the old test, all of that historical time in India would have counted and that becomes quite a substantial entitlement because it's a couple of months um, and it's paid at the wage they're paid at in Australia when they leave. Now, that time in India didn't count uh, because they had no contemplation of coming to Australia at the time. Where it might be caught, uh, because we do have obviously a lot of clients like I know uh, Laura does with people who kind of move around, is let's say the person started in India, but they were always managing a team here in New South Wales. And then after a number of years, they came down to New South Wales and finished off their career here before they left that is much more likely for there to have been a substantial connection the whole way through. But unless you've got something like that, you're now pretty much in the clear and only have to look at the local service. So that's a good news one. Uh, I, there's no chat talk about actually legislating it back in the other direction though. So hopefully this one will stick. Last, last one from me. So look, um, this is something that will go through and that this is the protection of migrant workers um, in New Zealand. We do have an issue um, in New Zealand with the exploitation of migrant workers. Um, less of a problem, obviously, over the pandemic where we closed our borders for about 18 months too long. Um, but it, now that the borders have slightly opened a bit and we've got more migrant workers coming in, the government have acknowledged that in fact there needs to be better protection for migrant workers. Most of the exploitation in New Zealand or alleged exploitation um, occurs in, for example, orchard fruit pickers, that kind of role. Um, there is a little bit of it in hospitality. There is a little bit of it in retail. Um, it became so serious before the pandemic that we had an 0800 line that you could ring if you were being exploited and were new to the country. And we created a special visa category for migrants that thought that they were being exploited. And some of the stories that have come out um, in New Zealand through the press of exploitation and indeed through the Employment Relations Authority are horrific. So people working 80 or 90 hour weeks and getting nothing, um, having to um, work in a retail store and do their bosses, housework, ironing, cleaning and everything, all hours of the day and night. And, and these people are here really to get into New Zealand, so we'll take any deal. So it's a real issue, and it's something that the government have acknowledged needs to be dealt with. So now we're going to have much more power in, in terms of the immigration inspector, inspectors and labour inspectors to go into a workplace and demand documentation. So it is, it, it, it is a requirement in New Zealand that every single employee has an employment agreement, it wouldn't surprise you if I said a lot of these migrant workers don't. It's a requirement that everybody's paid minimum code, that they get their four weeks annual leave, that they get the minimum wage, which is about to go up in April. So this will give a lot more power to the regulators to go into workplaces and work out exactly what's going on. Importantly, there's also a bit of a name and shame um, regulation that's being introduced here and in that there will be a blacklist of people that cannot employ uh, migrant workers or indeed I suppose that could stretch to anyone at all. There will also be an extension of that that if you are caught exploiting a migrant worker you will not be able to manage or direct in a company which is quite extreme and has led to uh, will lead to potential changes in the Companies Act. So it's being sort of treated quite seriously as it were. So the stand down list will be the biggest deterrent I think to those who exploit. They will simply not be able to operate in that capacity. But there's also a range of uh, new offences being introduced in terms of you didn't produce the documentation, you're not paying the win uh, minimum code, you didn't do as we asked in a certain time frame. So what's interesting about this is how we are going to resource it. There's a bit of a theme emerging here, Clancy, isn't there? And that we are going to need new inspectors. We're going to need people working for the regulator who do this work. So look, the intention of this legislation is brilliant because it is going to protect migrant workers in New Zealand. Um, we're just going to need more people on the ground that are that are doing the enforcement. But it's all good news, as it were, to protect the vulnerable.
I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Got two is the, the special sign I've been given for any questions. But otherwise, as I said, Laura and I will be around for a few minutes as well. We've done it. We've done it. No questions. We've covered everything. <laughs> it was either really boring or really good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. And good luck with your final ASG session. Thank you. Thank you.